first of all, we'll see the distribution of the water on the Earth. So they're saying that ocean covers 71% of the Earth's surface. If you see the Earth's surface as a total, the so 71% is covered by the oceans. It means water. And sometimes you'll find 70%, so it's not uh, a big deal. If there is a plus uh, minus 1%, so it's okay. And 29% is the land. Now the global ocean covers 71% of our surface, land mass is covered 29% of the earth surface. This is the general distribution of the land and the water on the earth. Now if you see in further detail, you will find that ocean and seas contain 97% of the earth's water. So that is the important thing that if you see the earth water and you will see the distribution of that one so 97 percent of the earth water is contained by the seas and the oceans in other words you can say this is the salty water not the fresh water only three percent of water on earth is the fresh water in this you have the underground water you have the rivers okay and then 70 69 percent of this fresh water now they are doing the distribution of three percent okay we have discussed that the three percent is we have what fresh water now if you talk about 69 percent of this three percent not the total only three percent is the fresh water in the deep freeze ice sheets if you see the north pole and the south pole mean the continent antarctica so you will find that more three sixty-nine percent of that three percent fresh water is in the form of iceberg ice sheet or that the frozen water that is the further distribution of that one now they have given here in the another diagram so it is a graphical representation so if you see this is the earth and the earth's 70, 97% the water is oceans and the seas and only 3 is fresh water, 3% is the fresh water, got it? From that 3, almost 69 and 70% is ice caps and glaciers and 29% of that is ground water. And if you talk about further, so the one percent is easily accessible fresh water and in the mean in the form of lakes okay the after that you have this one percent now they are dividing this one percent again so from one percent six fifty two percent of the water is in the in the form of lakes 70 uh, sorry 38 percent in the soil in the form of a moisture and 1% in the air in the form of water vapors. So this is the further distribution of that one. So in the exam, they will not ask this kind of distribution that you have to tell that from that 3%, how much this one. So they are just want to tell you that the fresh water is uh, in a limited quantity on earth. And from that fresh water, as you said that only 3% is a fresh water. And that from 3% is in the form of ice and glaciers. Got it? And then it is you divide further that one 1% 1 the lake. So you see, just like they want to tell you the importance of fresh water. And then you have 1% rivers and water in living things, means even the plants, animals, humans, all this 1% is there. So this is the general distribution of the water on the surface of the earth there's another diagram the same thing so here you have that 97 uh, percent as i told you that is the saline water oceans or the salty water and only three percent is the fresh one from three percent thirty percent is the ground water and almost seventy percent is the ice the caps or the glacier this percentage sometimes 70 sometimes 69 it's not a big deal because they will not ask this percentage in the exam. After that, the surface water, the water which is available on the surface. So 2% is available in the rivers, 11% in the swamps, and 87% uh, uh, in the lakes. 
So like this, it is found there. So this is again another diagram for the general distribution of the water on the surface. Now the water cycle. Now you know that the water is moving in a cycle and it is on the earth going into the atmosphere and again coming back to the earth. So first, the part, you can say the part of the water cycle is precipitation. Precipitation means that when the water comes in the form of rain, sleet, snow, or hail. So when at that time, this is known as precipitation. When the water falls from the atmosphere to the ground in the form of rain, sleet is also the form of the you can say the snow if it falls then you have the snow and then you have hail sometime in with the rain it comes even in the priya and in your countries which are even not cold is come there so these are the precipitation so once again if they ask they give the example of precipitation you can say rain sleet snow and the hail so water also comes in the form of the precipitation from the atmosphere to the ground. You can see here they have shown this is the snow, then you have the freezing rain or the sleet, you have the hail and you have the rain. So this is the how the water comes back from the atmosphere to the ground. After that you have the surface runoff. Precipitation that flows over the ground surface eventually finding its way into the stream and rivers. Now they're saying that if there is a precipitation, maybe in the form of rain, maybe it is in the form of snow or hail, whatever. So finally, it will come from higher places to the lower place. And eventually, and finally, it will, you can say, come or it will, you can say, um, it will come into the stream or rivers or it, it, it will, you can say combine itself into the river and the the streams so this is the known as surface runoff when the rain water or precipitation run like this from a higher place to the down place so that is known as surface runoff after that you have interception interception they're saying that when there is a rain or slow or snow or sleet whatever especially the rain when it fall to the ground so maybe if you have a tree in the way if there is a tree so it falls on the tree and you will find the raindrops remains on the tree so that is known as interception the precipitation that does not reach the earth's surface due to being obstructed by the trees and plants so that is known as interception the process in which the rain is stopped by the trees and the plants and the water rain drops remain on the trees or the plants so this is known as interception after that you have infiltration infiltration mean that when there is a rainfall or that water run from a high place to down place so when it will start to absorb in the ground when it start to absorb or soak into the ground so that is known as infiltration precipitation soaks into subsurface soil and moves into rocks through the cracks and the pore or spaces so that's known as infiltration so you should remember these definitions so maybe sometime in the they will give you a diagram and you have to label it so when the rain water soaks into the soil or in the ground so this process is known as infiltration after that you have through flow through flow means the down slope movement of water through the soil roughly parallel to the ground surface is known as through flow you can see here in the before we talk about this one see here the surface runoff here you can see that water is coming from 
higher place to the down place you can see here from higher area to the down area but if you talk about this through surface you can see here okay here you will see that water is moving almost the same level parallel in this way so that is known as the through flow down slope movement of water through the soil this is inside the soil not above roughly parallel to the ground surface it is little bit from up to down but not like the surface run off but it is almost you can say parallel to the ground then you have ground water flow the slow horizontal movement of the water through the rock so here you can see now with the help of diagram i'll explain to you now see here this is the precipitation and here the water is stopped by the you can say the tree so that's known as uh, that uh, uh, in sorry here down you will see that water is going down and it is going in the form of that you can see it's known as infiltration it's going down and after that when the water will reach to the underground water you can see here this is the underground water level in the underground water level when the water flows from one place to another it is all under the ground so that is known as ground water flow got it so here once again the difference between these three in this one the true flow it is in the soil in the soil not in the ground water but when you talk about ground flow water means underground water when underground water moves horizontally from one place to another but you talk about the sub uh, the surface flow the top one it means that above the surface this is above the surface the flow of water from high place to the lower place above the surface of water that is known as the surface run off but if this flow of water inside the soil if it is inside the soil so that is known as through flow but if the flow of water under the ground means the ground water so that is known as ground water flow i hope all of you got the difference between these three different movements of water please verify ah uh, yes okay after that evaporation evaporation like the physics chemistry you are evaporation means when the water vapors they will uh, the water will convert into liquid uh, sorry the from liquid to gas without boiling so that is known as evaporation so here the liquid water is converting into vapors or gas so that's known as evaporation so evaporation the water from ocean seas and other water bodies is changed from water droplets to water vapors invisible so water vapor mean invisible water particles in the atmosphere due to heat so that is known as evaporation you can see here the sun the heat from the sun is coming here and the water vapor they are rising up in the form of a gas so that is known as evaporation now they are saying that not only water is evaporated from water bodies also the other things which contain water especially the living things you can see here for example the the plants when the sunlight falls on them so water inside the plants in the leaves or in the stem when the sunlight falls on them it also evaporate okay so then it is known as transpiration the evaporation of or the fusion of water from the plant leaves in and that is known as transpiration this is also evaporation but it is from the plant leaves where the unused water is converted into you can say uh, vapor for example here the first process what is the first process the water is absorbed by the roots 
and then the that water is going to the leaves or the plant with the help of the stem and then it go to the leaves and the from the leaves it is evaporated so that is known as transpiration condensation condensation is a opposite process of the evaporation in condensation that the water vapor which are in the form of a gas so they are converting into the liquid for example if you see the diagram the water is evaporated and it will go above a uh, cold above you can say in atmosphere and the temperature is less so this vapors convert into clouds and these clouds they when they uh, become heavy due to the uh, temperature and then they will fall in the form of precipitation means rain sleet hail okay so that or snow that is known as that uh, the precipitation so simply the water vapors converted back into liquid or the solid particle or ice due to decrease in temperature with increasing high uh, height by air current or it's known or cloud so that is known as condensation you can see here even you can see here if the water vapors are going out and you put some ice above here temperature will decrease so these water vapors again convert into the water drops and come back so here you can say it, this is a vapors and here when they convert into droplets again so that's known as condensation now the water cycle so here there are main process in the water cycle so this is really important because sometimes this diagram comes in the exam and then you have to label it so you can say the first step you can say here that water is evaporated water is evaporated due to sun or the heat energy so it is going from the sea and oceans or the river the lakes all this one so that's known as evaporation at the same time water is also evaporated from the trees that is known as transpiration transpiration and evaporation is the same but they are given the different name due to the different you can say situation because here is from the plants but here from the water bodies when these water vapor they rise up okay so they will condense and they convert into the form of water uh, you can say clouds and then these clouds again they will temperature become less so they will be you can say condensed and then they will come down in the form of precipitation okay and precipitation means again i told you you have snow you have sleet you have hail and you have rain so all this one then this when this comes down then you have surface runoff from high level the water comes to the lower level so that's known as surface runoff and then you have infiltration infiltration mean that the water is absorbed by the you can say the soil or the rocks and this one and then underground water when it moves from one place to another so that's known as ground water flow so you should know all these processes again here this another diagram so please go through this diagram also the same thing here they will say this is a evaporation this is transpiration then condensation then you have precipitation then surface run off then you have infiltration then you have surface flow then you have ground water flow like this so just try to memorize all these process the main ones because when we practice the past paper they will come there then they're saying that why human need water you know that the why we need human water so if you can divide the your needs into different categories so first one you can say domestic needs domestic needs mean that the human using the water at home in home 3% of domestic water use for drinking and cooking if you have 100% use of water at homes from that 100% only 3% it use for drinking and cooking and other is converting uh, by for washing for cleaning and other purposes then they are saying medcs we remember we already discussed this one it stand for more economic developed countries so in more economic developed countries 50% of domestic water is used for washing and flushing the toilet and 20% of 
water is used for washing clothes much less domestic water is used for washing flushing the toilets and laundry in less developed economic developed countries l e d c s so this sometimes they use these terms you should know m e d c s mean more economic developed countries and l e d c mean that less economic developed country they are saying that if you see the domestic use of the water for washing and flushing it is more in more economic developed countries as compared to less economically developed countries why because in less economic developed countries you don't have that much of facilities for washing and all these things so most of the water is not used for this purposes after that you have industrial use of the water for example industrial use of the water if you see use for cooling in production of electricity if you remember we talk about when you produce electricity so it is used there when you are producing electricity by geotherm uh, geothermal also also by the fossil fuels also by the coal also by the nuclear power so you will use the water to produce the steam and that steam is used to run the turbine with high pressure after that also use as a solvent so water is also known as universal solvent because most of the things are dissolved in water after that the third one is agricultural need so the most part of the water is also used for agriculture purposes irrigation mean watering the crops and the plants irrigation is the greatest use of water in agriculture and after that uh, rather than agriculture also if there is a uh, some kind of animals or the livestock is uh, you can say kept by the farmer so they also using by the animal so that is known as agriculture need so this is how the water is used in domestic industrial and agriculture now we will talk about the main source of the fresh water so first one is the surface water mean the water in lakes rivers and swamps so that is known as the surface water this these are the swamps mean here you will find the the forest and then down you find the water you can see here this type of the water bodies are known as swamps so after that the ground water the another the source of water is the ground water water in the soil and the rocks under the surface of the ground which are called aquifers so here underground water they are known as aquifers so this is another the source of water that is available on the earth after that water from rivers water can be taken from the rivers by simply dipping a bucket into it so if the you know that if you talk about the countries like egypt like sudan so the you will find the most of the cities and the population is near the nile river and the people are using the water from the nile and direct use whatever for drinking for washing although they are cleaning it before using but the main source of the water is the river after that in some most of the countries they are making the reservoirs near the river side they make the dams all these things to store the water also so this is another source of the water after that service reservoir so service reservoir is also a storage of the water is another type of reservoir in which treated and portable water is stored the water towers or cisterns so this is another the water what they will do for example they will take the water from the river they will clean it and they will store it here or sometime they take the water from the rivers they store it for some time and after then they clean and then supply to the city and for homes like this so this is another type so for that you have the water towers mean you store the water in the towers sometime may, maybe you find in your city there is a uh, water towers above i will show you the diagrams and also cistern i will show you that one also these are the water towers maybe you'll find in your country or in with some village or cities like this so here the fresh water so the clean water the after treatment it is stored here so that is water towers sometime they are made by steel sometime they made by concrete different types you can see and you have the cisterns also this one so here you can say water from the ground and 
water this is the cisterns you can say water is under the you can say some buildings because by this way they can stop the water evaporation the water is not lost water from the ground now if you talk about the water of the ground so you can say alternating layers of permeable and impermeable rocks trap the water in the permeable rocks permeable means that the something which allow the water to soak in or the water can pass through something so that is known as permeable and if the water cannot pass through something that's known as impermeable so here saying that there are a lot of rocks they are permeable or impermeable so it is water is stored under them they trap the water aquifers the water stored in the porous rocks of the limestone under the ground most common way in which the water is obtained from the aquifers is to sink well mean wells you know that you are using old age they are using the wells under the ground and they are putting some bucket down and they are taking the water after that you have another type is known as uh, if the water is stored under the pressure the aquifer is called if the water is stored somewhere and water will come out of the surface without anything without any pump with the pressure come out is known as artesian aquifer water from the well sunk into the artesian aquifer will rise to the surface without the need of a pump i will show you some diagram of this one what is in by this mean this one see here here this water underground water is coming out with a high pressure without any pump or without any water pump only some countries they have this one not everywhere for example here you can see this one this is artesian aquifer this is also one of that water come with a high pressure automatically after that water from the sea that in countries like saudi arabia like uae all the gulf countries they are cleaning the sea water they are making the sea water drinkable they are converting salty water into a drinkable water or converting to drinking water or the fresh water by a process and that process known as desalination the the uh, the plant in which this treatment is done when the sea water is pass through different treatments and after that it is converted into fresh water which is supplied to the home so that's known as desalination plants and this process known as desalination and in saudi arabia in jubail the mam and jadda lot of desalination plants are working which are fulfilling the needs of the water in saudi arabia you can see this is the real diagram maybe you saw this one in near the sea side so here how they are doing this one the provision of energy and salt water brine in uh, chemistry electrolysis maybe you studied the brine brine mean the salt solution so they are using the energy there and doing this one one is the met the second method of desalination process is reverse osmosis so in which the salt water is pumped with a high pressure through a fine membrane so they will take a salt water here and this is a membrane membrane mean just like a filter so with a high pressure they will move this water from here till this side so what will happen there if you see with salt pumped into high pressure fine membrane the 30 to 50% efficient and requires less uh, lesser energy the as compared to distillation so here what will happen the salt will remain here it will stop the salt particles and the water will comes here purified water so this is known as the reverse osmosis and here again the same thing here this another diagram of the same process but here from salt water with high pressure so this is passed through this membrane this membrane stop the salt particle and the fresh water will come here this is known as reverse osmosis then you have distillation you know the distillation in which the water is evaporated they will evaporate the water and then is convert into steam and that steam is condensed again into the water and that is known as distillation these are distillation plants then water quality and availability now they are saying that water rich countries 
the countries with plentiful fresh water supplies so they are known as water rich countries some are large countries with plenty of land for rain to fall on for, uh, for example russia canada china and some with the world's greatest river flowing through them amazon uh, yangtze and mississippi river so they are saying the there are different you can say uh, sources of water some countries they have lot of rainfall and they store that rainfall and they use that water like russia canada china but in some countries you have rivers great rivers like in sudan you have the nile river in egypt so in the so these are two main sources of fresh water so if the country has any one of source of these two so that country is known as water rich countries the water poor countries the countries which don't have the fresh water supply and they also don't have the the much uh, precipitation or the rainfall so that is known as water poor countries then water conflict that sometime the conflict between the countries states on water now if you see that uh, the in the nile the egyptians uh, are egypt they are claiming that this is their you can say Uh, they have the more right rather than any country although it is flowing through sudan ethiopia and uganda also so sometime that have water can also create the conflicts because water is life there is no water there is no life after that the physical water scarcity so means if the water is not there so there is two things physical mean water is not available the not enough water to meet the both human demands and those ecosystems to function effectively and why does it happens this uh, uh, may due to the low rainfall or high level of evaporation sometime due to the low rainfall in some particular area or there is a temperature is really high evaporation rate is high so then this is the it is going evaporating so then can be water is not available there the arid region frequently suffer from the physical water scarcity it also occur when the water seems abundant but resources are over committed sometime the countries they have a water but they are not using it properly it is wasted so they can also have the physical water scarcity mean the physically water will be disappeared from there that economic uh, water scarcity mean that caused by the lack lack of investment in the water infrastructure sometime they have the water but they don't have the money or they don't have a infrastructure the countries so they can apply they can send it to the people and they can complete you can say fulfill the demand of the uh, country or the people so that's known as economic water scarcity mean water is there but they don't have resources to clean it to supply it to the people so that's known as economical water scarcity after that we have a sanitation system sanitation system mean that the water which is waste water it is coming from the homes and from factories it should not mix with the fresh water otherwise there also the fresh water is not available for drinking water treatment process also that which ensure the water supply to the people safe and drink okay so in rural areas uh, they don't have that much of the water supply system as compared to the urban areas so here they are saying that unlike the rural areas urban areas are higher access to the safe drinking water because cities are more wealthy places with factories and offices so they can have lot of money the lot of resources that they can make possible to get uh, the water to everybody on average people income are higher people have higher income easier to put pressure on the politician or leader to make the improvement wealthy people are more likely to live in cities so they have a money so they help, they can make infrastructure water pipe are easier and cheaper to build when a lot of people live close together this is another thing then you have multi purpose dams you can also make the multi purpose dam you you know the dam dam mean the water storage at a high place so this dam is known as multi purpose why because from this dam when water comes from a higher and move to the turbine so you can getting electricity also this they have the water which after electricity this water you can also use for drinking after cleaning it after the treatment of this one you can also use for so this is known as multi purpose you can say the dams and what are the purposes the country's generation of electricity 
flood control, irrigation, tourism and layer. Then we have provision of water, then creation of habitat or wetland species, access to boat and other you otherwise inaccessible areas, renewable source of energy, don't produce greenhouse gases, reduce the fossil fuel consumption. So you create more jobs. So all these are the multi-purpose dam. I mean, lot of if you have a dam, so you can get all these, you can say things from there. So it is really important you should know how the a dam can be used as a multi-purpose role. Okay, so in the previous page, we discussed about the advantages of multi-purpose dams, and these are the disadvantages. As we said that the if you are going to build a dam, so you have to relocate the people if the, any population is there, flood land, flooding land, so there is a chance the lands can be flooded, disrupting of the life cycle, mean the fish, and also because the when you are making a dam, you are stopping a water which is comes from a mountain to the rivers. But when you make a dam, you will flow, you will stop that natural flow of water. So it can be uh, disturbed the life cycle of different fish. Alternating water supply for the people downstream through dam. If the, they don't have the, uh, for example, if they have a dam, so people has to choose another alternative, the source of water near the dam, reducing the enrichment of the soil downstream. So before what happening that when the water comes from a high place to the down place, so this soil which is here, it will get a lot of minerals and nutrients from the top when it comes here. But when you stop this water here, so this land which is here, it will not receive that, uh, you can say the minerals and the different nutrients and expensive to build requirement and the jobs like this. So all these are the disadvantages. Sometimes it comes in the question in the exam in the form of the right advantage and disadvantages also. After that, you have the assessment. So you can write the uh, advantage and disadvantages of the different things and you can copy and complete it. And uh, after that, you have the here you have to write look at the list of advantage disadvantage of the dam project given above copy and complete the table below by adding each of the advantage what are the environmental advantages and disadvantage of a dam what are economical advantages and disadvantages of a dam what are social advantages and disadvantage dam environmental as we said that it will not produce greenhouse gases like this alternative to the fossil fuels economical means you produce electricity a lot of people get the job social means you, you can get the for tourism purpose for other purposes also so you can just list from there and write it here now where to build a dam so here that where you can build the dam build you cannot build the dam anywhere there are some places where the dam can the dam can be placed or the dam can be built not everywhere so it is a natural, you can say, the place where the water comes from different sides from high to low. So then you can make a dam there. So if you see here, deciding where to build a dam requires detailed study, which includes. So before making a dam, you should know all this uh, survey or the research. High precipitation to provide sufficient water. You will make, build a dam in a place where you will have a lot of rain or snow or this one. Lower temperature. So th at that area should have a lower temperature. Otherwise, the most of the water will evaporate. Built on strong, impermeable rocks. So you have to make the... Uh, you can say build a, a dam on a, a surface where this impermeable means it will not allow the water to go down. Otherwise, most of the water will go down. Built high up in order to have good potential for hydroelectricity power. So you should make a dam at a high place so you can make the water fall down from a higher place and produce kinetic energy in it and then you can uh, produce electricity through it. So this is another reason. After that, the narrow, steep sided valley and uh, there, if you are make a dam, so it's better in both side. You have the hills like this and down you have the this one, a small gap. So this is why, because if you don't have these valleys, other, then you have to make big walls to store the water. If you already have the mountains around, so they will save you a lot of money. After that, rivers and lakes nearby. So there should be uh, nearby the lakes or the rivers so you can get the water from there also away from developed areas so here it should be away from the developed areas mean from the cities so and it can cause the pollution there 
easily accessible make in such a way that you can easily go there you can produce electricity and all these things so this is the when you want to make a dam so you should keep the all things in your minds after that the are the dams are sustainable as i told sustainable mean that they can uh, fulfill the need for today and they can also fulfill the need for the future alternating for burning of fossil fuel as no greenhouse gases are produced good unsustainability of the dams how the dams are unsustainable reservoirs can become silted due to the material carried in you're saying that after maybe 50 years 60 years the dams they get a lot of salt inside them because water is come and stored there and stayed there so dam structure under a lot of pressure so it will there is a life for every dam maybe after that you cannot store the water the walls become so weak have negative effect of the environment and the fish population so these are the points which make the dam unsustainable and this is the point which makes the dam sustainable sometimes question can come write a reason why the dams are sustainable you can write this one if the question comes why the dams are unsustainable so you can write these two okay these are the key terms you can go through just like the definitions after water related diseases what are the diseases which are related to water and the water is a reason for that to spread water provides a very good habitat for living things there is a plenty of food water in water because the presence of plants and their ability of photosynthesis the water provides nutrient rich environment for bacteria bacteria may enter drinking water from sewage sewage means the you can say not clean water if sanitation is poor if these bacteria are pathogen and the water in which they live is drink untreated without treating them you drink it disease can be spread so now what are the water borne disease these are really important because you'll find a lot of questions by gcc past paper so spread by consuming contaminated water due to the poor sanitation and untreated sewage or by washing food pots and pans or hands and face in dirty water so what are the main diseases cholera and typhoid so these are the two main you can say big water diseases so here we see them number one is the the cholera and other is the typhoid we'll see now ineffective bacterium means which bacteria is for, responsible for them this is a vibrio cholerae cholerae and after that you have salmonella typhi or salmonella uh, para typhoid so these are the virus as you can say uh, pathogens or bacteria which are responsible for them the time before onset or symptoms after the infection what are the symptoms or what are the you can say uh, the time frame on which the these symptoms appear a few hours up to the five days or six to 30 days these symptoms can appear symptoms what are the symptoms for cholera you have diarrhea and vomiting and for typhoid you have fever of abdomen pain with the skin rash diarrhea and vomiting also consequences can be mild but can lead to the dehydration and can also cause the death again three to five percent of infected people remain as carriers with no symptoms if untreated fatal complications can be there and also can be uh, life threatening and what are the treatment rehydration vaccine exist antibiotics and the vaccine also exist for that so be careful this is really important this uh, table after that the strategies to control the cholera what are the strategies you can adopt to control that one Ensure the sewage and drinking water are kept separate. They should not be mixed. Sewage removed directly into a treatment works before, uh, sorry, water being treated before it delivers into home. Do not use contaminated water to wash the food. Hands should be washed after contact with any facial uh, material. Facial means the material which comes out of the body. And uh, boiling water and chlorination, boil the water or add chlorine to kill the germs and bacteria, which they are doing in the water. Uh, you can see treatment. The water 
bread diseases the carrier uh, breeds in water and spread the disease by uh, biting its victim example is malaria now malaria malaria mean that water this this is not due to water but water is work as a habitat for some insects like mosquito and mosquito is called malaria uh, is create you can say uh, cause malaria uh, a life threatening disease which is transmitted through a bite of infected anopheles mosquito that carries plasmodium parasite once bit uh, bitten the parasite reaches your blood stream what are the symptoms high temperature and fever you sometime you have the diarrhea dehydration and feeling weak these are the symptoms for this one the life cycle of this one so here you can see the life cycle you have the plasmodium this plasmodium it is go inside the mosquito and mosquito first bite a initial human as a host and then this uh, is goes to the liver and the liver it go to the blood stream and the blood stream now it has a plasmodium when another mosquito comes and bite that person who is already infected so then it this mosquito will take the plasmodium also with it and transfer to the next human and again this process goes on like this in the exam they will not ask by this way but as a biology student you should know this thing how it spreads again you can see here this another diagram to explain well so you have you have released the for example first one you have the blood meal and then this plasmodium and this plasmodium going to this uh, mosquito mosquito will bite the human it will go to the human blood stream and then the, it will go to the liver cells and then also when it go to the liver cells so infection of red blood cells and then again from red blood cells it will go to the you can say the blood stream another mosquito will come eat that blood take blood from that person again it will convert it will take plasmodium and that plasmodium inside this uh, mosquito again it will spread and then again it will go to the other person so like a cycle of mosquito so this is a, a disease which is spread by water as a habitat strategies to control the malaria the individual can prevent the being uh, you can say by uh, prevent being uh, bitten by the mosquito they are put the mosquito uh, you can say insecticides uh, wearing the cloth cover the body and spraying insecticides okay and they are building an accommodation this is for as a individual level for the government what they should do they should spray the insecticide in the building the draining wet lands if because if you, you will not allow the water to st stop somewhere and gather somewhere then it means you will uh, you can stop the breeding of the mosquitoes so you don't allow the water to be stored somewhere after that you have eradicating eradicating malaria means completely removing the malaria parasite from the population controlling the vector is not enough so you have to the main thing the water you should not let the water store in some place where the bacteria can you can say uh, breed themselves and produce more water pollution and its resources what is the water pollution water pollution mean when you in something added to a fresh water is known as water pollution what are the main sources of the water pollution the sewage sewage mean that water comes from the homes or the industries mean the filthy water or the dirty water so it is known as the the sewage and it is the main source of water pollution you can see here the domestic waste also that when the water comes from home it can be from the toilet it can be from washing clothes it can be when washing the dishes and all this one that is also the domestic waste and comes out and make the water pollution industrial waste you can see that that a high amount of waste comes from the industry and this water dissolved in the fresh water in the rivers so that is also caused the water pollution and you can see here this the seas and agriculture you can say practices as we discussed in the last chapter that using the lot of you can say uh, the insecticide or pesticide when the uh, rain due to the rain this pesticide they come to the stream river and the lakes so they also cause a water pollution and the uh, agrochemicals mean the chemical or the 
uh, sprays which are used in agriculture like pesticide, herbicide, or fertilizer, they are also the, in, you can say, source of the water pollution. What are the impacts of the water pollution? Global inequalities on sewage and water treatment. The developing countries have difficulty treating water and sewage compared to the developed countries. They're saying that if the water is polluted, so the developed countries, they have a lot of resources. They can treat that water. But the less developing countries, the developing countries, they don't have resources. Risk of infection, bacterial disease, typhoid and cholera, it means that if the water pollution there, so they can risk of the diseases. Accumulation of toxic substances from industrial uh, process uh, uh, in the lake and rivers. So yeah, they're saying that if the water comes from the industry, it will, uh, you can say, go into the lake. So there will be a less defi, there will be a deficiency of the oxygen and due to accumulation and then the fish and other things will die there. After that, you have the biomagnification of toxic substance in food chain. So what does it mean? They're saying that uh, increases concentration of toxic substances like mercury and pesticide in the tissue of organisms at successively higher level in the food chain causing illness. Because if this, this uh, water pollution is come to the rivers and the lakes, so then it will disturb the food chain also. Bioaccumulation means what accumulation of toxic chemicals in the tissues of a particular organism that's known as bioaccumulation. The formation of the acid rain when the fossil fuels are burned, so carbon the, uh, sulfur dioxide is produced or nitrogen oxides are produced when they go to the atmosphere, they, you can say, mix with the rain and causes the acid rain, then the acid rain comes down and this causes the, it can increase the acidity of the soil. It's also increased the acidity of the lakes, which also kill the fish and other organisms which are living in the lake. So this is also an impact of this one. The effect of the acid rain, you know, that when the acid rain comes, so it will lower the pH, which makes the environmental intolerable. And uh, for aquatic life, the fish eggs laying is reduced, that mercury amount is increased, al aluminum clogged fish gills be causing suffocation, they will die. So all these are the causes of the acid, I mean, again, the impacts of the acid rain. And this diagram shows how acid rain is formed. These are the gases like goes up and mix with the rain water comes down in the form of acid rain. So you can go through this one's easy. Acid rain, so this, these are just like uh, explanation. So no need to remember this uh, chart, which is given here like this. It's just like uh, for more details. Then you have atrophication. Atrophication means what? That this is a pro natural process that result from accumulation of nutrients in lakes or other bodies of water. So what happened, you can see here, this is the form, it forms on the surface of the water. And due to that, the fish, they cannot get the proper oxygen down, they can die. The uh, other, the, you can say the process, they stop, they stop the sunlight also to passing through the, you can say the water, a lot of things happens there. So due to that, it is causes the marine life. Nutrients enrichment leading to the eutrophication. So what happens, how the eutrophication happens? Increase in nutrients such as nitrates and phosphate in water bodies causes the algae. So here you can see that algae is more. Why? Because they increase the amount of phosphates okay, and nitrates there. And death of algae causes the increase of organic matter that acts as a food for bacteria and decompose the dead algae. Bacteria use up oxygen, they use most of the oxygen, oxygen is not left for the other organism and they can eventually die. So you can see this flow chart here. Here another one, you can see how the eutrophication happens and how they cover this one, how they stop the sunlight and how the fish under this one, they are not getting anything and they will die. So this is a process, you can go through this one and you can easily understand this one. Sources of eutrophication, you have discharge of untreated municipal nitrates and phosphate nitrogen compound produced by factories. All these are the sources of eutrophication. Managing pollution of the fresh water, how you can improve the, the pollution of the fresh water. So for, for that, improve the sanitation. Means separate the, you can say the water, which is coming from the dead, uh, you can say the, uh, from homes, which is dirty water, from the toilets and also the waste from the factory, this one. Waste can be 
uh, removed by if you want to remove the waste collection of the system of the savory the swear, swear pipes of savory that collects human feces and urine and waste you can make them how i will show you this one this is for example here uh, sorry this one so uh, connection system for example you will just make a system like this so these pipes when they from your the toilet is go directly in a separate pipes so they will not mix the fresh water and other water connection of the uh, you can say septic system which uh, consists of underground seal uh, settling tank so now i think in, uh, in saudi arabia also they don't have the sewage system so under a building there's a big tank where all the dirty water stored and then the tanker comes and they take it and also the water treatment plants are there the they are saying that if you want to improve this so you need the flush toilets so they by this one they can you can not allow the mix your waste with in the normal water you can uh, make the pipes and the pipes can go through the the savory system and then they can go through out of the city then you have the poor toilet mean this is also the type of the toilet they are using this one this is first type and this is the second type and this is the more economic developed countries they have this one the pit latrine system it is a old age and even some the poor countries they are using this system also so then you have the composite toilet in composite toilet they also using this system and the dry toilets in which uh, vegetable waste straws gases sawdust and are added to the human waste to produce the compost so here they will add this one whatever the human waste come they are adding the vegetable waste and all these thing there you can see here down and the composition toilet is a type of a dry toilet that treats human waste by biological process called compo composting this process leads to the decomposition of organic matter and turns human waste into composite like material composing is carried out by microorganism under control aerobic conditions so like this you can convert the waste into less harmful waste the treatment of the sewage mean the water comes from the the homes and the factories so how you can treat that one so for that first of all you have the sewage outfall so you should have the pipes from there the sewage comes out in a place from all the fact factories and the houses you have this is the domestic the sewage mean the from the home it comes here first of all the screening tank if in the water if there are the big particle you can see here so they put a screen so all they are be separated here so that's known as screening tank that the first thing they are doing after that a primary treatment our first settling tank so when the drop uh, this water comes the filthy water from the homes so they will allow to settle down here so what what will happen when this water will stay here for a long time so what will happen so the heavy particles or the salt particles they will settle down in the form of a sludge and other water mean water with uh, less particle it will remain up and then you can take it out from other side and later on you can also remove this sludge from here what is the second treatment in second treatment water is pumped into the tank where oxygen is bubbled through it so you can see here the water will come here and then from down oxygen is bubbled what will happen what is the use of this oxygen due to this oxygen the bacteria and microorganism break down the organic matter so that is will help this oxygen will help the bacteria and microbes to break down the organic matter after that second treatment second settling settling tank so then again they will allow the water to stay here and again the heavy particle will settle down like first one after that the sludge which you are taking you can take it the sludge digester so this sludge which you are you will settle down here so that is like that's to oxygen free condition you will put there and then you can uh, decompose break down the sludge releasing the methane gas and this methane gas you can use for cooking from here so this is known as sludge digester tertiary treatment mean third treatment what they are doing that further filtering out its uh, effluent or its chlorination so this process when they adding the chlorine and what is the purpose of chlorine to kill the germs and bacteria 
so the third step they are in the third uh, treatment they are doing the adding the bacteria so here again you can see this is the waste water first the screening from screening the first sedimentment tank the the heavy particles they settle down again you can remove them from here then we'll come to the other one so here again the sludge comes down then here again aeration means the oxygen is bubbled again again settle down here more sludge will come here again in the third step you will add chlorine which kills the bacteria and then you can add water is take out so this by this way you can make the waste sewage water which is coming from the factories which is coming from the home it is really you can say dangerous it has lot of harmful chemicals the, the you can say uh, toxic particles but after this treatment it will become less dangerous or you can say other words safe it will become safe so again what is the first process the filtration the, the screening in screening the large particles are separated other this is the first sediment tank settlement tank they will keep the water for one hour one day large particle will settle down and then the water the from there it will come to the other tank again here they will keep it for some time again the large particles come down then this water comes here oxygen is bubbled here or when oxygen is bubbled so this will encourage the bacteria and microbes to de decompose the or organic matter again here the sludge mean the uh, waste which is heavy particles they come down and again the chlorination and after chlorination the water become lot of you can say more safer and the sludge which is coming down they will do the its uh, uh, you can say digestion without oxygen and they produce methane gas ch4 that methane gas you can use for the cooking purposes or burning purposes also so this is the how they are making the water safe which water the sewage water which is come from the factories and this one water treatment the water treatment mean the water which is coming from the rivers lakes how you can make the more you can say safer for drinking purposes so again the same thing here for drinking what is the first the coagulants mean these are the special type of a chemicals when they add it to the water so they will take the dirty particles or dust particle they will gather them and they will settle them down so this is known as coagulation the process also in chemistry the water treatment then they allow this water to settle down that's known as sedimentation what will happen all these particles which stick together they settle down here and after that they will pass through to the next step when they will pass through the next step that is filter they will put filters here this filter can be in the form of sand in the form of gravel mean the stones they will allow this one then they will add fluorine fluoride because fluoride is good for teeth so they will add this one then you will as this infectant infectant mean like chlorine chlorine and other thing they will add to kill the bacteria after that again this is the tank where they are adding this one then corrosion control they are uh, making it safe and the corrosion or the rust will not add in this one then water after that when the water become safe after germs and everything so this is the storage tank where the water is stored and after from here it is supplied to the homes and other places for use the coagulation what is the mean of coagulation coagulation simply they are saying that the particle in water are st stuck together and settled to the bottom of container water is then filtered through sand chlorination mean to kill remaining pathogens chlorine is as a disinfectant so this is used as known as chlorination it's a process then population control and sorry the pollution control and legislation so thing they how you can control the pollution for that you have to make the legislation the legislation mean that you will uh, make the rule uh, new laws new rules so that you can stop this legislation means you are doing at a government level you can stop is a individual level but 
unless the government will not make the laws strong laws will make the punishments or the rewards then you cannot stop this pollution puts a pressure on the polluters polluter mean the people who are making the pollution like the factories or at a human mean as home find a way to reduce the pollutant industries are required to monitor the pollution they cause and keep it within the set level for example they are saying that for example sometime the the smoke comes out from the chimneys of the factories so they will put some kind of a filters here they will not allow the harmful gases to go out in atmosphere they will filter it so you should keep that level then you have the binational great lakes water quality agreement so this is the name of a agreement and a uh, loading limit of phosphorus was set they are saying that 11000 metric tons a year in response to eutrophication issues in great lakes of us and canada so they said to the all the factories that you can up to 11000 metric tons of phosphorus only you can do if you go beyond that then they will put some fines on that one fines for exceeding set limits companies may be uh, prosecuted and extreme cases forced to shut down you should uh, run the inquiries about uh, against the companies and if they will not follow you can shut them down incentives may be leads so you should also encourage the factories who are taking care of the pollution and trying to reduce it in the form of tax relief give some some relaxation in the tax and other things so these are the key terms the savage pathogen vector and effluent and chlorination so this is the chapter number 4 of the water i already added the notes in the blog and you can download from there and this is for your chapter number 4 inshallah next class we will 